Hi guys, welcome to another episode of U.S. History with Lennox. And today we're talking about the rise of industry during the Gilded Age. Now the Gilded Age is a time period in American history that spans from 1865 to about 1898. And though we see a rise in industry during this time, all is not as it appears to be. Hence the name, the Gilded Age. When you gild something, you're typically covering it up with something valuable in order to hide something that ain't so pretty. And that's exactly what's gonna happen in America during this time period. So hang on, let's get into the Gilded Age. I think a lot of people have trouble with the Gilded Age primarily because it centers mostly around the economics of our country. And let's face it, economics is a hard topic to understand, but we're gonna to try to break it down for you. During the Gilded Age, there were certain fundamentals that kind of guided our economy and the decisions that we were making. These four fundamentals include individualism, ownership of private property, free enterprise, and a laissez-faire attitude by our government. So what does all that mean? Well, basically, it's the idea that Americans had the ability to build up their own empire. They had the ability basically to grab themselves by the bootstraps, lift them up, and if they worked hard enough, they could achieve absolute success. Now, there will be arguments down the road that there were some roadblocks for certain people, but we're going to look at all of that as we move forward. I think the key term I want you to take away from this slide is laissez-faire. Laissez-faire is an economic term referring to the government keeping its hands off the economy, meaning if the government stays out of our economy and allows free enterprise or capitalism to progress, then we will all benefit from that. But once government gets involved, then the problems will start. And the challenge is going to be to find a balance between that idea and government regulation. And the Gilded Age didn't do the greatest of job with that. But one good thing did come out of the Gilded Age. It was a lot of new inventions, a lot of new innovations that's going to basically motor us through this time period and allow us to grow. Some inventions you might be familiar with that came out during the Gilded Age, the telephone, the electric light. And what these new inventions are going to do is change life in society forever. It's going to not only create new jobs, but it's also going to create a new society in America. One that's focused not just on work anymore, but also work and pleasure. It also inspires what I call a new and improved market revolution. Now, we studied the market revolution during the era of good feelings, and the same thing was kind of going on then. We had a lot of new inventions, a lot of new innovations coming about. This is just revamping that whole idea with new inventions and new innovations coming out. Some of those innovations and changes included mass production, and with mass production comes mass consumption. And that's what's happening all over America during this time. The largest industry in America, quite honestly, during the Gilded Age is going to be the railroad industry. And that's going to be spurred by the Pacific Railway Act, which was passed back in 1862. If you remember correctly, during the Civil War with a Republican-controlled Congress in America, the Pacific Railway Act was passed that set the guidelines and funded a new transcontinental railroad. Now this railroad is gonna be built from Omaha, Nebraska, all the way to Sacramento, California. And it's gonna be built by two different companies. The Union Pacific is going to build the railroad headed west using primarily Irish immigrants to build their portion of this rail line. The other side, the Central Pacific Railroad is gonna come from Sacramento and work its way east. And again, Immigrants are going to play a huge role in the building of this railroad as it's going to be mostly Chinese immigrants doing the work. The two lines are going to meet up at Promontory Point in Utah in 1869. That's close to Ogden, Utah. And our first transcontinental railroad is going to be built. But that's just the beginning. Once that first line went in, the federal government realized the value 
of the railroads to our national economy. And they're going to start subsidizing the railroads, basically giving them free land or very low interest, easy to get loans to build these railroads. What the purpose of this is, is as these railroads are going to be built across these lands, it's going to increase the value of the land. And I'm going to be honest, the railroads were given a ton of land free just to get our market economy going. As we start to increase our railroads, we're also going to see new business practices come into play. Middle management is going to become something we had never had before, but will become a mainstay in the American you know, corporate world. You also see new levels of financing as far as getting loans and stuff like that. And also stock trading is going to happen, meaning that railroad companies to start with and then later other corporations will start selling stocks to finance their businesses. And then those who buy the stocks are going to reap the rewards and the risk that come along with financing a company. What's going to start happening over time though is literally we're going to have hundreds of railroad lines. And every single line is going to be different because every line was built by a different company. So consolidation is going to have to take place. And people like Cornelius Vanderbilt are going to work towards consolidating or merging these different companies together. And what that's going to do is it's going to bring a standardized system of railroads. Basically, if you look here, the gauge or the size of the rails was different from one railroad to the other. And that made it very difficult for one train to go from one company's rails to another. When we standardized the gauges, meaning we made width of the rails the same, it was very easy to start consolidating more and more rail lines. Another thing that came about from the railroads is going to be time zones. Before, we just went on whatever time we thought it was in the area we lived in. But since the railroad ran on a schedule, we had to make sure our times lined up going across the country. So four new time zones were created by the railroads and later adopted by the federal government. The building of the railroad is going to tie directly to the settlement of the Great Plains. And there's going to be cost and benefit for that. The benefit is going to be bringing our country closer together and expanding our national markets. The negative side well, we'll talk about that when we talk about the conquest of the West and the Native Americans. Railroads had huge impact on America. First of all, like I mentioned earlier, it created a national market. For the first time, we were able to mass distribute raw materials throughout our country, but not just raw materials, manufactured goods. And you started to see economic specialization throughout the country where different parts of the country would specialize in different products and then ship them via the railroad to other parts of the country. Like I mentioned before, this led to mass production of goods. And because these goods are available, mass consumption by the American people. They want these new manufactured goods and there's going to be a demand throughout the country for these goods. It's also going to promote the growth of other industries. And if you think about it, if we're mass producing, it's not just railroads we're mass producing. It's other goods. It's other services. So we're going to see new industries start to rise because of the railroads. It's also going to spur more immigration into our country. Think back to that very first transcontinental railroad. Who built it? immigrants. And as more and more industries start sprouting up, that means more and more jobs are available. And the more jobs that are available, the more attractive America is to immigrants throughout the world. So you're going to see the rise of immigration and also migration. We're growing further west. The Great Plains are being settled. More opportunities are becoming available to all Americans. So you're going to see Americans moving out west more, moving from the south to the north more all because of this impact of railroads. But you have to realize that without the railroads, we probably never would have entered into the industrial age. And the industrial age profoundly changed our country. We went from being a home-based, rural, and agriculturally-based economy to more of an urban and factory-based economy. And there's no turning back from that. And unfortunately, there's going to be some unintended consequences from the rise of industry in America.
corruption is going to be one of those consequences and the railroads are set up perfectly for corruption. Now I mentioned earlier how the government was paying subsidies to these railroads in order to get all these rail lines built. I mean they wanted to expand our market economy across the country. But what that did was it allowed for certain people to come in and take advantage of those subsidies. The Credit Mobilier scandal is probably the most famous example of corruption within the railroads that I can share with you. Basically what happened here was you had Union Pacific officials who set up a dummy corporation, meaning a corporation that existed in name only. And what they did was they used that corporation to gain more subsidy payments from the federal government through the Union Pacific. So in a sense, what was happening was the Union Pacific was reporting charges to the federal government that the Credit Mobilier company was charging them. But it never was really happening. There was no business arrangement between the Union Pacific and the Credit Mobilier. And so what happened was the government was paying the Union Pacific with the intent of them paying Credit Mobilier. But what was happening was those Union Pacific officials were taking that money and lining their pockets with it. I'm sure you're asking yourself, where was government in all of this? Well, quite honestly, they were in the pocket of the Union Pacific Railroad. You see, a lot of members of Congress had been given stock in the Credit Mobilier Company. So they were benefited from it. They were basically getting kickbacks from the money that was being sent to the Union Pacific to pay off Credit Mobilier. This is just one example of the corruption that was going on within the railroads. But there were all sorts of other problems going on with railroads as well. I think one of the biggest ones for individuals was speculation. We've talked about speculation before. The idea that speculators or investors see the rise of a company or value of something and they start to take out loans in order to purchase it with the intent of selling it quickly to make a profit. Well, because so many people were trying to buy stock in the railroads, the stock was overvalued. Basically, because it looked so good and so many people were buying it, they kept raising the price of it. But the business that those railroads were conducting was not enough to sustain that stock price. And so the value is going to drop out from underneath all those speculators. On top of that, what is going to add to that is the fact that railroads were just being overbuilt. We went from 3,500 miles of track when Lincoln was president to over 190,000 miles of tracks by the time we get to the turn of the century. We just had too much. And on top of that, a lot of people got into the railroad business and didn't know what they were doing. And so they didn't manage it correctly. So all those speculators who had been investing in railroads... When those railroads shut down, they lose everything. And the loans that were given to purchase stock in those railroad companies, they're not getting paid off either. So, so banks are going to suffer as well. But no one suffered more than the farmers. So you have to understand, railroads were used primarily for shipping. The more you could ship, the better the rate you can negotiate. Well, small individual farmers didn't have that negotiating power. So they ended up paying higher and higher rates to make up for the rate reductions that were being given to larger companies in order to gain their business. And on top of that, you had what was called pools forming, where different businesses might not be able to negotiate a lower shipping rate alone, but if they pooled all their companies together, they could get a lower rate and then they could split the profits. Meanwhile, the poor farmer's here just trying to get his crops to market and he can't afford to ship anything on the rail lines because of the high cost. Because of this, government is going to get involved. A lot of people are going to call for more and more government intervention. The idea of laissez-faire is starting to be questioned. And it's honestly the farmers who are yelling the loudest. They're the ones who are getting screwed over by all of this. And this is going to lead to what's known as the Grange Movement. And the Grange Movement is actually going to evolve into a whole new political party, which we'll talk about down the line. Supreme Court cases started questioning the idea of how the railroads were running their companies and what state governments could do. In Munvey, Illinois, in 1877, the, the Supreme Court said, you know what, states can go in and regulate these railroads and they can regulate how they you know, set rates and stuff like that. 
But a few years later, what's known as the Wabash case, the Supreme Court overruled itself and said, no, actually, it's not the state's job to do that. Under the Constitution, under the principle of federalism, interstate commerce is dealt with by the federal government. So it's the federal government's role to regulate transportation from one state to another. And with that, they passed the Interstate Commerce Act. And the Interstate Commerce Act created a commission to oversee like shipping rates and how business was being transacted across state lines and such. They gave oversight to the federal government on all of these railroads. And they basically said, hey, this pooling is out. And rebates being given to large shippers just to get their business, that's out too. And these railroad companies that are working together to fix their rates so everyone has to pay more or they don't get to ship at all, that's gone too. In fact, the Interstate Commerce Act said railroads must start publishing their rates now. No more behind the scene backroom deals. Well, the Interstate Commerce Act is the first attempt by our government to regulate business within society with the intent of benefiting society as a whole. That was the goal of the Interstate Commerce Act. Unfortunately, it was initially ineffective, but the foundation is there. And what we're gonna find when we get to the progressive era, which is in the early 1900s, is this Interstate Commerce Act is going to grow, become stronger, and start working a lot better for society. And that's gonna lead us to our next lecture within this rise of industry. But we're gonna look more specifically at industries other than railroads, like coal and steel and oil and the men who ran them. But that's next time around. If you have any questions, you can always rewind, watch again, post them in the comments. And if you liked anything you saw, even if it's just a little bit like the pictures, go ahead and subscribe. But for now, we'll see you next time and thank you for watching. Bye-bye.